Hello, I'm Robert Strand. I am the executive director of the Center for Responsible Business, the University of California, Berkeley Haas School of Business. And I would like to talk with you today about resilient leadership. And this is something that's coming up a lot in discussions these days, is the notion of resiliency and how to be resilient, how to have resilient organizations and companies uh, that can best address these very turbulent times, how to build resilient societies, and you as an individual, how to be a resilient leader. Now, welcome to my home. Here I am with uh, my, my wife, Sarah, and our sons, uh, Mikel and Jonas, are just in the other room. I may very well be joined by Mikel and Jonas here uh, shortly at any time. Now, undoubtedly, we all know how this feels to be working much more from home these days. And uh, this is something that some of us are more or less comfortable with uh, than others. And I think that this is uh, an example of resiliency and how we must exercise some degree of resiliency. And part of that is different norms that are established. And I would suggest that's part of leadership who, here too. So we'll talk about that here a bit today. Um, I've been studying leadership and sustainability and company strategy for a very long time now. And prior to that, I uh, was in corporate America for about a decade. Um, I've spent a good chunk of time in the United States, of course. I am an American, but also in the Nordic region. And so I draw a lot of inspiration and understanding about leadership and this idea of resiliency from the comparison, going back and forth and back and forth between the United States and the Nordic region. And there's some different norms of leadership that we see between the different areas, uh, as well as different systems that are put in place. That's informed my thinking here, and I'd like to share just a little bit with you about that. I currently am working on a book. It's called Sustainable Vikings, Nordic Leadership in Sustainable Capitalism, Building Resilient Societies. Maybe I'll draw a little bit from that here uh, in the few minutes that we have together here today. Three key themes that I'd like to touch on. So resiliency, leadership, as well as purpose. And they come together, uh, these different ideas. So resiliency, this is the capacity of a system, whether it be an individual, an organization, or a society, to deal with change and to continuously develop. Now, I draw this from the Stockholm Resilience Center. It does a lot of great work in the concept of planetary boundaries. This is very much related to the field of sustainability. And trying to understand how do we build resilient systems in societies. Now this is also uh, an idea with resiliency about innovation. How do we continuously innovate to meet the needs of the changing world? Now resilience is also being able to embrace uh, disturbance and roll with a little bit. Now, I can't help but think of when I'm, when I'm sitting here with you uh, about that fantastic two or three years ago, um, BBC clip. There is a, a professor and he's uh, from his home office is offering some commentary uh, to, um, to a, a newscaster back in London. And all of a sudden you see this darling little girl open up the door in the background. He can't see it, but you can as the viewer. And this girl kind of rolls in like this. And, and, and a few seconds later, there's a very distressed partner who comes running in and another child, and it's just a scene of chaos. And, and, and the, the individual being interviewed, the, the professor there, he kind of pushes his daughter away, you may recall. This whole thing went viral because it's just fantastically humorous. Uh, and it's also an example, though, of where my only regret in it is I, I wish that he would just picked his daughter up and put her on his lap and then finished the interview. And, and perhaps he regrets not having done that um, because in the moment it's very difficult to, to react to such a situation. But I'd like to bring that back to at the very beginning of this where I just mentioned here I am in my home and I have children and, and they may join us. And that framing of the situation, it actually grants me some ability to adapt and feel more comfortable, be a bit more resilient because I've framed the situation and some stuff might happen within it 
You might see a kid roll back over here and come and want to sit on my lap. And we can, we can adapt and we can uh, uh, absorb those sorts of disturbances, as they might be called, in a manner that's actually um, constructive and authentic. That's also another part of leadership is to be able to feel authentic and be authentic and bring our authentic self. So Ron Heifetz uh, is a leadership scholar who uh, articulated a concept that I draw from a lot. Perhaps it's because my background is in engineering. But he talked about leadership as much about ensuring an organization can as much as possible stay within a zone of productivity. And as an engineer, there's a, a lower control limit and an upper control limit. And Heifetz said, the leadership is about, and if you imagine this is over time here, leadership is about getting the organization to always be as much as possible in between that lower and upper control limit. And where the y-axis on this particular situation is, is a level of discomfort. So Haif has talked about sometimes you gotta turn up the heat for the organization to recognize that it has to do something. That's to get it above the lower control limit. Now clearly in the times that we're living in right now, nobody needs to turn up the heat at all. We all feel discomfort. So much of leadership in the current situation is about how do we pull it back down below the upper control limit. And much of that is framing, framing of issues. I offer my little example here. My, we could tolerate my kids coming in here right now and disturbances a little bit better because of the framing that I offered right away. Now that's just a kind of trivial example. But at an organizational level, how do you as leaders frame that gives us all within the organization a sense of being able to adapt a little bit more, being able to do some things that maybe we wouldn't have normally done? And I see this idea of purpose as being just this incredible framing device. Now purpose is something, and let me, take, let me use that to, as a segue to talk about leadership. I've now been studying leadership for the better part of 20 years, uh, both within the organizations and, and as an academic. And in that time I've come upon, I would ballpark between one and 50,000 definitions of leadership. A million of them. So many different definitions. One that I'm drawn to happens to be a leadership scholar, Joseph Ross. He uh, wrote a, a book called Leadership for the 21st Century. And he talked about leadership as an influence relationship among leaders and followers who intend real changes built upon their mutual purpose. That's why I was really drawn to this idea that, that Ross put out of leadership about and generating a common understanding of purpose, building consensus about purpose. And I would suggest that that is exactly the leadership that is so necessary right now within our organizations and beyond. But within our organizations, within our companies, to really clearly articulate what is our purpose as an organization. This brings me very quickly to what I'm wearing right here. This colorful lapel pin represents the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs. And the SDGs, as I'm sure many of you are already aware of, some of you maybe not, and a few of you maybe incredibly closely and in depth. The SDGs are 17, our 17 greatest challenges that we face on this planet all rolled up into one framework and even more succinctly on this one beautiful lapel pin. And the sustainable development goals, for example, number one is no poverty. Number 13 is climate action. Number 10, growing inequalities. Number three, good health and well-being. And of course, the current crisis that we face, we can see where number three of the SDGs is very much in front of our faces every single day. But there are Interactions with other SDGs that we also see. Number seven, decent work and economic growth. And the SDGs is this framework that brings these problems together and where you can see the interactions between them. And also where we as organizations, as companies, can figure out which of these SDGs do our competencies most lend themselves to address. Now, I'd like to use an example drawing from the, the Nordic region of a firm that used the Sustainable Development Goals 
as a means through which to better identify and articulate its purpose. This is Grundfos, a Danish company that described itself as a pump company, as in water pumps. And that's what Grundfos has been for many, many years. But since the launch of the Sustainable Development Goals in 2015, its CEO and the organization have asked themselves, which of these SDGs do we most closely touch? Which is most material for us as an organization? Well, SDG number six, clean water and sanitation. And what the leadership at Grundfos has done is determine a higher order purpose for its organization to say, we're not just a pump company. We are clean water and sanitation. Now, that's something that you can jump out of bed for. That directly is obviously an expression of a fundamental need to live and to have a quality life. So the SDGs present an incredible framework for us all as leaders within our organizations to look at, to map to, to try to understand what is our higher order purpose? And then being able to use that higher order purpose as a means to really congeal the organization as opposed to we're just a pump company or some particular product and service. It helps to reframe things from an inside out perspective, inside out being what are our existing products and services that we're trying to push out of the world to an outside in. Where are there real problems in the world, real needs in the world, and how can we utilize our competencies to address them? Now that's also a very inspiring and hopeful view of the world. When we look at the problems and say, how are we gonna actually address these problems? It's inspiring because talent wants to do that. They wanna be engaged with real issues. As opposed to think about, I'm worried now that I need to sell something more in the world. I need to sell my product in this scary time. How do I do that? That's more of a fear sort of approach. Now just here, when we talk about disturbances, I don't know if you can hear it, I hear a car alarm going off in the background. Now I'm gonna acknowledge it right now because I felt a little bit of discomfort here. We're talking and maybe you hear it and I didn't acknowledge it. So some of this is also how we actually build norms where we can acknowledge some of the disturbances. And then we can actually weather them a little bit more. If that car alarm keeps on going, I'll just forget about it, so will you. But if I didn't acknowledge it, maybe you'd be sitting there saying, geez, this guy's got a car alarm or his kids in the background, this sort of thing. So part of this is also that resilient leadership is to actually acknowledge the realities that we face. Put them on the table so that they're not side distractions. I'd also like to talk finally then specifically about purpose. Now, I would suggest a great exercise that you could do as an individual is to pull up those 17 sustainable development goals. And say, which of these SDGs, which are you most drawn to? Which resonates the most for you? I do that with all my students. And it results in fascinating, oftentimes very personal discussions. I'm drawn to Number three, good health and well-being, because maybe I lost a loved one due to diabetes. And that's the SDG that explicitly addresses reducing non-communicable diseases. So then that also is an opportunity for that particular student to become aware of the kind of organization that he or she most likely wants to work with. But just ask, we do this as individuals. And we do it as organizations. And then we articulate to the outside world. I'm an SDG three company. Novo Nordisk, the Danish producer of, of insulin. Their mission is to eradicate diabetes. Now, if you identify as an individual, SDG number three, as being the one that speaks to you most personally, because perhaps you have a family member that's been afflicted with diabetes, you can just imagine how motivating that is to work with a firm that says, this is our mission. It's even more motivating than saying, we're an insulin company. Say, we're here to eradicate diabetes. The world can change and does. And when you have a higher order purpose as your central theme for your company, 
you can address and adapt and maneuver much better than if we're just seeing ourselves as an organization that sells something. Purpose is much about understanding your competencies. It's about understanding your organizational competencies and bringing them to a higher order. And what incredible opportunity that we have with that. And the final thing I'll say there is that purpose is such an incredible motivator. Money's a great motivator. We know this. The research is in and it's clear. Yes, people work for money. But it's a bit surprising. For knowledge workers, we need to pay people enough money to take the issue of money off the table. Beyond that, it's purpose. Purpose is what motivates us. We need to pay people enough money so that they can focus on the task at hand, so they can focus on the overall purpose. From a leadership perspective, to motivate and congeal an organization to move in a common direction together. Purpose is such an incredible means to achieve that, as well as being an important end in and of itself. And when you articulate yourself as an organization, as a particular SDG organization, SDG 3 or 10, or in the case of Grunfos, number six, clean water and sanitation, that opens you up to so many opportunities including attracting and retaining the absolute best talent possible. So purpose also enables us to frame situations within the zone of productivity. Part of that is building resilient organizations, building resilient self. I hope that to see you very soon on campus at the great University of California, Berkeley, a place where our purpose is the common good. And we are a public institution who serves the common good to foster discussions and debates and research about what it is to build a good society. And I would suggest that you also have an opportunity within your organizations to better connect folks within your companies to a sense of purpose and to foster those debates and discussions. Many of us burn for this. We're business people. We're also citizens. We're also parents. And for us to bring our whole self to work, we desire purpose. And that's a big part of leadership. So thank you so much for spending time with me today. Uh, it's been a privilege, and I look forward to seeing you at Berkeley very soon. Take care, and be well. Thank you.